In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Gospel of the Lord. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, on which side of history are you? This phrase was popularized by the former U.S. President Barack Obama, the wrong or the right side of history. For example, in his inaugural address as president, he declared, To those who cling to power through corruption and deceit and the silencing of dissent, know that you are on the wrong side of history, but that we will extend a hand if you are willing to unclench your fist. Very powerful and prophetic words. This phrase, the right or the wrong side of history, indicates that on certain political and moral issues, history is bending towards an inevitable outcome, and those who resist it are just wasting their time. This idea is not originally the former president's. Being on the right or wrong side of history is an idea that comes straight from the Bible. It expresses an understanding that time and our very lives are marching forward, whether we like it or not, towards an inevitable and desirable outcome. In the first reading, we heard from the words of Prophet Baruch. He expressed this viewpoint in a time when the, ex the Israelites were experiencing tremendous turmoil. They believed that they had reached the zenith of their success as a nation when the Davidic kingdom had extended its boundaries to its maximum from their perspective. But something devastating happened in the year 586 BC. The Babylonians invaded Israel and utterly defeated the Israelite army. They invaded Jerusalem and destroyed the temple of God that Solomon had built. Baruch is writing just five years after this violent defeat. And in the midst of the shattered dreams of Israel, inspired by God, Baruch is prophesying to Israel to inspire renewed hope in their hearts. And what was this hope? The hope was this, that although the temple was destroyed, Baruch, probably recalling what Solomon had mused when he was consecrating the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8, 27 to 28. Solomon says these words, Will God indeed dwell on earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house which I have built. And so with the temple destroyed, Baruch raises the sights of Israel to another level of the presence of God. God would continue to accompany his people wherever they might be scattered. 
even though the temple was destroyed. And the God who accompanied them wherever they went would help them to rebuild Jerusalem one day as a center of worship for the nations. And so Baruch was saying that this is how history is going to pan out. And if you want to be on the right side of history, O Israel, live out your call. Become the people that you were meant to be. And in a poetic way, he expresses this when he says, Every high mountain will be made low. Every valley will be made level ground. And Israel will walk safely in the glory of God. The same idea that history is bending towards an inevitable outcome is expressed in the words of St. John the Baptist in the Gospel, uh, or as the Gospel expresses his mission in the words of St. Luke. John the Baptist comes to us as the last Old Testament prophet, so to speak. And St. John the Baptist is proclaiming a new hope at a time when suddenly the prophecies in Israel had, Israel had gone silent. And now John the Baptist comes as a voice in the wilderness declaring to the people of Israel that their Savior was very near. That their Savior was coming to them in the flesh in Jesus Christ. And what must they do in order to welcome him in their midst? This is the same thing that John the Baptist says, which will echo the very words of the prophet Baruch. Make straight the ways of the Lord, says he. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. The crooked paths made straight. Rough places will become level ways. And all shall see the salvation of God. And so what is John the Baptist telling his people of his time? Change your lives. Repent. Let your lives reflect the glory of God that you were meant to be as a people of God. What about St. Paul in the time of the church? So many things have happened between the time of John the Baptist and St. Paul's time. And in his time, they have seen how the Messiah was rejected, how he was crucified. But then he rose again from the dead. He gave a promise to his church that he would come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And so what does St. Paul expect the Christians of his time to do in that hopeful expectation of that outcome in history that they longed for? that Jesus would come again to judge the living and the dead. We read in the second reading how St. Paul prays for his beloved community of Christians in Philippi. He prays that their love may increase, that they may discern what is of value, and filled with the fruit of righteousness, they may prepare for the day of Christ. What about our times? In the prayers of the liturgy that we will be hearing today, we hear in the words of the prayer of the priest, particularly the post-communion prayer that you should listen to. We pray, or rather the priest prays on behalf of the people, that the Christian people may discern what is of value in the earthly things, while keeping their minds and hearts fixed on heaven. And that means on the values of the gospel. The values that we are called to live as true disciples of Christ. We are his presence in history until he comes again. And so today, on this second Sunday of Advent, perhaps through the mouth of the prophet Baruch, through the mouth of John the Baptist, and St. Paul, and the words of today's liturgy, God is asking us to ask the question, am I living the call that God has given to me? Do we believe, like Israel, at the height of the Davidic kingdom, that we have reached the zenith of success in our particular field of perhaps work, 
or our family life or our relationships? Or is the Lord asking us to change something? Is the Lord asking us to make straight the ways for Him to enter our lives in this season of Advent? How do we make straight the ways of the Lord in our own life? Even as we are preparing for Christmas, we, our thoughts rightly go to sharing of gifts, decking up our house, cleaning up. But on a personal level, are we influenced by the spirit of materialism and consumerism that keeps us longing for more and more, that feeds our greed and not our need? Today, perhaps the Lord is asking us to make straight a way for Him to enter into our lives by making some time for prayer in the midst of our busyness. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. What kind of mountains do I find in my life? Do I find pride keeping me apart from someone in my life? Preventing me from granting forgiveness to another? Or in the midst of this wonderful and joyful season of Advent and Christmas, am I still bearing grudges against someone? Have I not made room for someone in my life by my unforgiveness? Perhaps the Lord is asking us to make room for them by forgiveness. The crooked paths are made straight. All of us are in the midst of this pandemic trying to live our lives perhaps as married people with children and grandchildren. What is the Lord asking to set straight in our marital life, in our life of relationship between parents and children? What is the Lord asking you as parents and grandparents to ensure that you bring up godly children? In the midst of the celebrations of Christmas, are you also emphasizing the spiritual dimension of the celebrations? And how are you doing it? The rough places will become level ways. We as Christians, while living our lives in this world, we are called to work for peace. And peace in the Christian understanding is not just the absence of conflict. But peace comes when we work for justice. Someone sent me a beautiful meme which shows the difference between equality equity and justice. Equality means that you treat everyone the same without paying attention to the differences of their needs, their difficulties, their place in society. Whereas equity is about considering those differences and trying to make everything so that people have equality of opportunity. But justice is working so that all those obstacles that prevent people who are poor and ma marginalized from coming up and experiencing life as a God-given blessing, those obstacles are removed. And so as Christians, we are called to remove those obstacles that prevent people who are poor and marginalized from experiencing justice. In what way is the Lord asking you, asking me, to be an agent of justice and peace in society, in the family, in the church? Perhaps for us as priests, the Lord is asking us, has the, the clericalist mentality entered our heart, our mind? Is clericalism urging priests and others who hold authority in the church to seek out privileges without the responsibility that comes for caring for the souls and the lives of our flock. Perhaps Advent comes to us as a season to remind ourselves of our role as guardians of the flock, to be available to our people, 
to make a good confession, to experience the conversion of their lives, and to draw closer to the Lord until He comes in glory. And all shall see the salvation of God. This is the hope of the nations. This is the desire of all the nations. That Jesus should come, not just 20 or, or thousands of years from now, but it should come yesterday. Because when Jesus comes, everything will be set right. But in time and history, you and I are the presence of the Lord. Just as Baruch said to the people of his time in Israel, the word comes to you and to me. Become what you were made to be, O Church of God. When they come to our communities, people of other faiths, do they experience in us the kind of love, the kind of mutual understanding and community where God's presence is felt? When a person visits our homes, our families, do they see and admire, see how much they love one another. Do they experience the joy and the peace of the Lord in our churches? Or do they experience the same kind of division, the same kind of narrow-minded mentality that we see in the political world? Then perhaps we are on the wrong side of history. Because Jesus comes, and He comes again and again. When He comes, will we welcome Him with joy? Or will we receive Him with fear and trembling? It all depends on how we use our time, how we use our resources, how we use our position for the good of others. Let us pray that as we participate in this Eucharist, we may not become worldly, in our mentality but inspired by the gospel we may live with this awareness that God lives with us and that fact calls us to live in a particular way to shun what is worldly what is sinful and to work for justice so that in every human heart they may experience the peace of Christ Amen